So my name is Paul Hobson. Uh, I work for a, an environmental consulting firm called Geocentech Consultants uh, in Portland, Oregon. Um, we've got offices all over the country, though. Um, I'm a water resources engineer there. Um, just very briefly, uh, I'm not a trained programmer. I'm a civil engineer. Uh, I learned MATLAB in college, uh, and um, Matplotlib got me into Python. So. Here I am, this is my first SciPy. Uh, everything's been great. Thanks for having me. Uh, so this talks about uh, PyGridGen and PyGrid tools, uh, and we'll talk about those in a little more detail, but sort of the underlying theme here is um, the fact that these came to be as a successful, I believe, collaboration between the private sector, uh, academia, and the open source community. Um, I don't like to waste too much time on telling you what I'm about to tell you, but uh, I will acknowledge uh, the key players who made this happen. Um, I'll, I'll skip the personal background. Um, you've already got enough of that. And I'll go straight to the topical background, and then we'll talk about sort of the foundation, the abstraction, the community, and the enhancements to these tools. And if all goes to plan, we'll have time for questions. Um, so. First off, uh, Dr. Pavel Sakov at the Australian Bureau of Meteorology wrote the C code for curvilinear orthogonal grid generation. Uh, that's a mouthful. I don't expect you to know exactly what that is, although I'm sure some people do. Uh, we'll get into that shortly. Uh, following that, uh, Dr. Robert Hetland um, at Texas A&M wrote uh, C types Python bindings to expose uh, Dr. Sakov's code uh, to people like me who um, read C very slowly, I'll say. Uh, uh, next, uh, Felipe Fernandez and the Conda Forge team uh, really uh, did some great work in packaging all these tools such that via Conda you can install them very easily on uh, Unix like systems. Um, and then uh, some folks at my team, uh, Lucas Wynn and Rika Enriquez, uh, have fearlessly dove into the code that I wrote and made it a lot better and given me a lot of good feedback and uh, contributed a lot to these projects. And then, of course, I want to thank SciPy Conference and the organizers. So here is a curvilinear orthogonal grid that I generated uh, to model um, a small creek in very, very, very northeast Washington state. Uh, you're almost in Canada and you're almost in Idaho when you're at Su Sullivan Creek. A um, couple characteristics uh, that you can see. Uh, the, the mesh sort of uh, refines and rarefies based on areas that I was interested in. Um, there's islands within the grid. And, of course, the grid curves to follow the natural morphology of the river. Um, and these are all very important uh, in my work, uh, hydro, uh, running uh, hydrodynamic models uh, to answer questions about sediment transport, pollutant paint transport, and just basic hydrodynamics, conservation of momentum, things like that. Um, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this, but this is just some basic vocabulary that I'm going to use when I talk about grids. Uh, the boundary of the domain is the polygon enclosing the generated grid. Uh, there is this concept of a turning point, and those are uh, points on the boundary that either work to close or open up side channels in your domain. Uh, we'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, a node or a vertex, uh, those are the actual that's sort of the output, that those are the components of the grid uh, where these points get placed within your domain. The shape's just your, your number of nodes uh, in each direction, much like a NumPy array has a shape, grids have a shape. A cell is a quadrilateral defined by four adjacent points within your grid, and then you have a centroid of a cell. So here's uh, two little rectangles right next to each other. And I generated a grid in both of them. Uh, however, uh, I defined the turning points differently. And so the, your, the bright green points are positive turning points, and they work to close the grid. And as you see, if I don't tell 
the grid tool anything about um, the rectangle on the right hand side, it, it can't work its way in there. The numerical uh, scheme can't traverse that part of the boundary too well to get grids in there. So I used two negative turning points at the start of that side channel and then close them again at the end and now, and now the grid tool knows to work into that side channel. What, what this demonstrates is that the, the sum of your turning points valued between, well, I think strictly speaking they can be valued anything, but the sum of all your grid of your turning points needs to be four. And if you think about it, four corners in a polygon or in a quadrilateral. Um, and so here we have four uh, minus two plus two is four. And so that worked out. So that just demonstrated what I meant by t turning points. Um, so I'm not an expert on the mathematics of uh, grid generation. Uh, differential equations was probably the hardest class for me in college. Um, and that's probably not gonna change anytime soon. <laughs> um, but uh, the, when I read through the C source code, uh, this numerical conformal mapping comes up a lot. Uh, and uh, the code is based, uh, from what I can tell, on two papers, one from 1998 on the cross ratio and Delaunay, Delaunay tri triangulation scheme for generating the grid. And then um, Delaunay triangulation, I think, is pretty well known, even if I don't quite understand exactly how it works. Uh, but it also uses uh, schwartz christoffel transformations, which were described in a 1980 paper uh, in the Journal of Science and St Statistical Computation. And then uh, it uses some partial differ differ differential equation solvers, namely Broyden's method. Uh, you throw that into a big pile of compi compiled C, and you get grids. Uh, yes? I'm gonna get there. Um, so hopefully I answer that question. If I don't, yell at me. Uh, so uh, li like I mentioned, Dr. Sokov wrote these four foundational libraries. Uh, two of them are for interpolating data onto the grid once you've generated it, but you kinda need it to get the grid generator to work. And then there's the grid generating library and a utility library to work with those grids. Uh, they're pretty tricky to compile. And th this is kind of where the community starts to come in. Uh, it probably took me about two weeks. I'm, I'm not good with compiling C sources, but it took me about two weeks to find the right incant incantations of configure and then editing the output of that configure command and then holding my mouth right as I typed make and make lib. And eventually I got to work and I got to compile. Um, and I generated a very simple grid for a project just from the command line and um, we ran a model and it worked and we were all very, very happy. Uh, but you do have to call that executable from the terminal, which um, working with a bunch of civil engineers isn't always um, a good option. Uh, the input file for that command line looks something like this, where you give it an input file, this xy.o, ex the extension doesn't matter, um, but that's a, um, a space delimited file of your x coordinates, your y coordinates, and the, turn, the value of your turning points. Um, and then you tell it what to output the data to. You, this nx and ny parameters are the shapes of your grid. And the remaining parameters are um, prescribed in the source code. Um, I've tweaked with them and I've noticed the shapes of the grids change slightly, but not dramatically. Are they mostly speed up or slow down the computation as to how refined the, the solver is going to be. And the, this rectangle and sigma files uh, are I intermediate computations that are cached. And then um, if you regenerate the grid, it can use those. So, so long as your boundary didn't change, it can, it can speed things up. So um, that grid generated something that looks like this. Uh, you can see I've got two, well, I don't, uh, this is an example from the C source code. This is an estuary system. You got some side channels, you got a marsh in the middle, and then it dumps out into the ocean. 
Um, this is a very practical example. This is some, a lot like something I would use. There are also in the sea sources some very uh, artistic examples. Um, and the circle is particularly interesting to me because the turning points are valued at 0 0.3333333. So he didn't use whole numbers and then you, you still add up to one and you get this cool shape. Uh, so moving on to the Python part of this, uh, like I mentioned, uh, Dr. Hetland uh, used uh, C types to make some Python bindings. Uh, he vendored the C sources with the source code and included some build instructions. Um, uh, once I found this, my whole world opened up and one, just because I got to use Python and I could sort of iterate in a notebook a little bit faster and that's good. Um, it, it still had the problem that uh, Leonardo alluded to where distributing compiled sources with Python is really hard. Um, there's no way around that. Or there was no way around that until Conda kind of came around. Um, but he also included uh, some interactive uh, grid boundary creation tools via matplotlib that were pretty uh, handy. And uh, he exposed an API to utilize focus. And um, with the work that I do with numerical modeling, specifically maybe I'm curious about the stormwater discharge into a river, being able to focus the grid on certain areas is really useful. And so here's an example of what that looks like. Um, kind of a similar setup, just sort of two rectangles, one protruding from the other. Uh, but this time my little side channel is kind of narrow and I don't get, I only get two pairs of nodes going through there and so that means that it's only one grid cell wide through that channel. Uh, but maybe I need a little more detail in that channel so I just add focus and now I get four sets of nodes, therefore three grid cells. Uh, here's another example where you can sort of add just to demonstrate that you can add focus in both d directions along the grid. Um, I have a side channel and a side channel and I focus on both of them. So getting to the Python, um, I'm trying to move kind of quickly here. Um, uh, it kind of looks like this. You get to use your NumPy arrays. I think we all know them. We, maybe we don't love them, but we all know them. I love them. Uh, but uh, so yeah, you just define your x, y, and your beta. Beta is the turning point value. Um, you create a focus object, you add focus to that uh, in different directions. Uh, and then, you know, there's some parameters of that, you know, the factor as to how much you want to focus and then the extent to which that focus should spread across your grid. And then you do pygridgen.gridgen and you give it all that information. And like I said, you end up with a pretty cool grid. Um, so let's go to the community. Um, like I said, this was hard to compile as it was, hard to bundle compiled sources with Python libraries. Um, and I had the feeling, although I can't really say this, but at least within my organization, there was increasing demand for this kind of stuff. Um, and CondaForge came along and saved us all. Uh, you know, if you're not familiar with CondaForge, uh, it is a community-driven set of Conda packages that you can install by using the channel option when you install via Conda. Um, the packages are hosted on GitHub as feedstocks uh, that contain a recipe and some CondaForge-specific configurations. Uh, commits to those feedstocks re-trigger continuous integration that builds that builds the packages and uploads to anaconda.org um, packages for Windows, Mac, and Linux. Um, so this was a huge boon. Um, when you use Conda to grab these packages, the installation's really simple. Conda install pygridgen and just tell it to grab, grab it from the Conda Forge channel. Uh, it grabs all of the C dependencies for you. You don't have to worry about compiling those or even finding them. We still can't compile this on Windows. Like I said, I'm not uh, good with compiling sources in general. On Windows, I, 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 just, I, I just don't know how to do it. Um, help in this area, if you're interested in grid generation, would uh, be very much appreciated by many, I, I think. 
Um, but the other cool thing about this is maybe you do need to build this from source. Maybe you can't use Conda, but the, now the Conda recipe serves as like this canonical build set of build instructions for how to make this work. So that's really great. Um, so eventually I got asked to build a grid for about 60 miles of braided streams uh, near the Great Lakes. And I was gonna have to mer like, it was so much stream and the model domain was so detailed that the, the solvers were kind of choking on my computer. And so I was gonna need to merge a bunch of different grids that I generated separately. And um, I had to do a lot of crazy things with that focus per per parameter that I was using. So I, I dug into the Python source and I cleaned up a few things. I added some doc strings uh, and I cached some slow to compute parameters um, so that when I, as I was iterating on the grid, thanks, um, as I was iterating on the, on the grid, uh, I could just iterate a little bit faster. It didn't have to recompute everything every time. Uh, Dr. Hetland was uh, kind enough to accept these into his repository. Um, and the other thing I did since, um, you know, you, you kind of build your grid and then you run the model and if the grid's good, you forget about it and you spend all your time on the model. So I documented all of this uh, and I pushed it to GitHub pages. Um, it's right here. Uh, I've got, Several examples, if we have time, I'll kind of poke around the documentation in a little bit more detail to just kind of show you. I know I'm sort of light on the Python detail, but that's because it's all here, and um, I think the time's better spent talking about the broader picture. Um, but there were some things that uh, I couldn't ask uh, Dr. Hetland to give any of his attention to, because he's busy enough as we all are. Um, so I split off into PyGrid tools that just provides like a higher level set of utilities to merge, split, refine grids. Uh, they're probably for my group, the, the biggest thing that we've done is the spatial data IO. So you can read and write GeoJSON data and then you can actually take your edited node, like you can dump the nodes to GeoJSON, edit it in ArcMap or QGIS or whatever, and then suck that back in as a grid and then continue working. Um, again, I pushed uh, docs up to GitHub pages. Uh, those look like this. Um, and we'll poke around there if we have time. So here uh, is just a basic example. I've got three uh, very, very simple grids that I need to operate on. Uh, the blue uh, on the far left is grid one and then in the center green grid two and then at the bottom grid three in red. So um, uh, when I'm not making grids, I'm working in pandas, and when I'm working in pandas, I do a lot of chained operations, and so that's kind of how I uh, designed this tool. So grid two dot merge, and you can merge vertically or horizontally uh, to the left, right, up and down. So you just sort of specify that, and you specify where you need to align the two grids. Uh, so then you, and then that returns a brand new grid, so you can merge that with another grid, and then you can refine in both the X and Y axes to just linearly add new uh, nodes, and then you can apply arbitrary transforms to, say, shift your grid in space. Uh, you can up, and then I always update the cell mask, and then you can plot it, which generated this figure. Uh, there's lots of operations like this that you know, when you're piecing together 60 miles of grid is pretty nice. Uh, Masking is also kind of a big deal for us because we deal, like I said, I was dealing with braided streams. Um, so if, if the green here is an island, a very simple geometric island, uh, you can mask inside the island or you can mask outside the island depending on what you actually need to do. Um, you can also mask based on the number of nodes that are covered by the mask or based on the centroids. Uh, but that's, that's kind of getting into the weeds. So let's go back to Sullivan Creek. Uh, here's the data I started with. I had a shape file of the riverbank, which is sort of the inner ho hollow polygon. I then, uh, by hand in GIS, drew um, the grid domain. Thank you. Um, uh, from there, uh, I 
decided what my grid shape was going to be. I added some focus to it, and I generated the grid uh, using my Pi Grid tool API wrapper around Pi Grid Gen. You can go either way. Um, from there, I masked cells with polygons. Uh, first, I fed it the river, which was just a data frame. Uh, and I said inside is false, meaning so everything outside the river needs to be masked because it's always dry. And then I took the islands and I masked inside those polygons. And then we ended up with that first shape that you saw. Um, and just to prove that this isn't all uh, numerical computation navel gazing, we ran a model through this grid and we designed a stream restoration program. And he, uh, I'm not in this photo, but uh, I took this photo in the field where we installed boulders next to a groundwater treatment barrier wall to protect it and also inserted some inverted root wads uh, to provide habitat for endangered salmon. Um, in addition, we've got some pretty cool plotting on top of it that isn't fully integrated into the um, code on GitHub yet, but we're working here. Here's some streamlines projected onto the grid. Uh, taking a page from Kristen Thing's uh, uh, model output, we've got a time series of water surface elevation in the bottom. Our red hash indicates where we are in that time series, and then we have data showing for that point in time there. Uh, more eye candy, this is just uh, raw flow speed. Um, this is my sort of roadmap for the tools, but this is a roadmap for any open source library. Uh, uh, clean up and pull in but, uh, the code you have on the side, um, interactive plotting, uh, Ju Jupyter widgets, better docs. Um, I've considered trying to rewrite it in Cython, but I don't know enough about C to work effectively in Cython, and I think SciPy has all of the solvers we need to make this work, but I don't know if I'll be able to find funding to do that. Um, here's where to find me. Uh, I'm on Twitter at PM Hobson, GitHub at P Hobson. Uh, that photo's when uh, the field crew only gets one pair of waiters, you have to buy the waiters for the tallest person. Uh, I'm also sending mixed uh, signals about workplace or worksite uh, visibility and safety uh, with my high-vis shirt and my camo waiters, but uh, that's what it takes. Um, I think we're out of time. Okay, any questions? Okay, thank you for the talk. So um, I know that there are many uh, powerful tools like HyperMesh or like ANSYS that are very powerful tools for grid generation and meshing. And uh, I mean, you are um, I mean basically able to mesh very complicated geometries with this with these tools. So my question is that what are the main features of these PY grid tools that uh, make it distinguished from those? tools, powerful tools, and like kind of convince people to like use it in a set of those tools? Sure. So I'm not too familiar with some of those other tools, but I, I have dug around in just my basic research trying to get this to work. And I think a lot of those tools are geared towards triangular grids, and perhaps they're geared towards building a mesh of a 3D object. And so they're really trying to... Um, match the visual features of those objects. Uh, these grids are designed uh, to sort of foster numeric stability in old models written in Fortran. Uh, so as these models are conserving momentum, conserving mass uh, through these orthogonal grid cells, um, you know, there's, it's, it's nuts, but if like your cells are too thin, or too wide or too short, um, the numerical models kind of get unstable. Un un you get kind of garbage results. Um, and so my understanding is that this tool is really geared towards the, the hydrologic, hydraulic modeling, um, oce oceanographic mo mo modeling, things like that. So it's, yeah, I, I, I think it's mostly a question of scientific domain. 
Yeah. Uh, Thank you for the kind words. And mm -hmm. I have a quick question. Like, I know that the underlying tools are all geared toward quadrilateral grids, but PyGrid tool, it has a lot of nice functionality that I would love to use, for example, with triangular grids. Mm -hmm. How hard would that be? From my point of view, uh, if I had to do it, it'd be impossible. <laughs> I know that there are people out there who could do it, but I'm pretty sure that, I mean, I, I suppose if you took your nodes and did something crazy with them, you could just say, oh, this is a triangle and this is a triangle that, you know, you, you would basically just be bisecting your rectangular cells. But I, I don't know if that gets, if that solves the problem. Uh, I wish I had a better answer for you, Felipe. Sorry. Uh, what kind of operations can you do with the grids uh, in Python? Uh, can you do things like uh, operate on the nodes or calculate some things in Python, or is it just meant to make the outputs for these other so, models? So the 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 grid object that I wrote is pretty much just a collection of two NumPy uh, master arrays, um, and it's just grid.x, grid.y, and with two, NumPy's array, with two NumPy arrays, you can do anything. And all those methods do is apply whatever transformation you're doing to both of those arrays. So with grid.transform, you can just write any function you want, and it'll apply it to both arrays for you. Does that, is that what you mean? OK. I was curious about, um, so this Py mesh grid, what output file formats does it export into? Is it facet files or? Um, uh, you mean PyGrid tools, the, this thing, or is PyMeshGrid something else? I'm sorry. Uh, uh, just the tools you were presenting okay. today. Does uh, it, what kind of file formats right. does it export so, to? So the grid format um, is just, like, like I said, it's just a collection of two NumPy arrays, one for your X coordinates, one for your, your, your Y coordinates. Um, when I'm writing spatial data out, I'm using the F Fiona library. So anything Fiona can write. So that's a shapefile, GeoJSON, uh, spatial vector formats are escaping me at the moment. But if uh, GDAO can write to it, um, uh, grid.toFile can write to it. Um, actually, this is just <laughs> a little advertisement that if you're interested in these types of grids, uh, curvilinear orthogonal grids or unstructured uh, triangular grids or more complicated grids. We have a BOF today at 5.30 and you're invited to join us to talk about how to deal with model output on these types of grids. Thanks, Rich. I, I meant to mention that and I forgot. Uh, okay. oh. One question for the audience. Did, did I answer your question about the input file formats? No. I think you're good. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody.